My name is uh, Gary Tomlinson. I'm the conference planning chair for GLPA. And every year since Ron Kachuk started giving this update lecture, I've asked the conference host for a special favor to allow me to introduce the update lecturer. This year I did not make such a request because for some reason I did not think uh, it would be granted. <laughs> <laughs> so I just did it anyway. Before I get started, I want to respond to several questions I've, I've received. And yes, I have lost some weight. In fact, 85 pounds to be exact. <laughs> Is uh, Barb and Greg Williams in the audience? May I, may I talk about you? That's true. Um, I had bariatric surgery shortly after GLPA last year, had most of my stomach removed. I've always have had and still have even more respect for people who lose weight the old-fashioned way, willpower, and that's just exactly what Greg and Barb did so many years ago, and so they are the ones who deserve your applause, not me. <laughs> my message to young people out there is it's easier to keep the weight off than to take it off, so um, I'll get off my soapbox now and get on to the task at hand. <laughs> Sorry you had to see that. As I've said, I've had the honor to introduce Ron since 2009 at a conference I did not even attend. You figure it out. My introductions have been, shall we say, non-traditional. <laughs> However, at this conference at Ball State, where Ron and I first met, <laughs> at our alma mater and Ron's current employer, I'm going to give a more traditional introduction more and more befitting the stature and res respect that Ron, I need my glasses. Eye surgery next year. <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't look so smug over there, I've got a pair for you too. <laughs> <laughs> One more befitting the stature and respect Ron deserves. <laughs> These hallowed halls, where Ron made the, his most significant discovery after months and months of research, Ron discovered that the roof of the observatory does open up. <laughs> we worked together on research for the 1973 total solar eclipse. Ball State was the place for research in shadow bands. Oh, no. <laughs> this was oh, a sign on our lab door. When I left 41 years ago, I took it with me. <laughs> Ron said he wanted it. I did? I took it anyway. So now, after 41 years, I'm bringing it back home and giving it to Ron. <laughs> with one cravat. I get it back in 41 years. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you know, I seldom post on Domel, but a few months ago I did. Um, concerning PhD astronomers running planetariums, I noted in general that that is not a good match. My observations have been PhD astronomers do not make good planetariums, planetarians. <laughs> and notice I said in general, Dr. Kachuk, want to go, astronomer Dr. Ronald Kachuk, PhD astronomer, yes. is one of those rare individuals that is not only good at research, 
He's good at teaching in all things planetarium. God, I hate him. <laughs> we, uh, we both worked for the first planetarium director here at Ball State, Dr. Newton G. Sprague. Yes. Who was quite a character, too. <laughs> Dr. Sprague insisted that whenever we did a planetarium show, we show we would wear a jacket and tie. Oh my. Ron always did go overboard. <laughs> Actually, this is a photograph of Ron when I got married, where Ron played the role of best man at my wedding. That, that was not his official title. That was just how my wife described him. <laughs> My son is named after Ron. <laughs> wait, wait, wife, best man, son? How well did you know Sue anyway? <laughs> I'm going to keep my eye on you. <laughs> Something I've never told Ron, that when I found out that Kayla was no longer going to give the update lecture, I knew we had to find a replacement, and I only had one person in mind. But the executive committee selected Ron. <laughs> Actually, I had asked for Ron's resume well before that, under the guise of collaborating with the GLPA cosmology show so that I could take his resume to the exec executive committee and the rest, as they say, is history. <coughs> so for the sixth time, it is my utmost pleasure to introduce Dr. Ronald H. Kachuk. <laughs> Ron has a shovel because even, though, even he knows it's about to get deep in here. <laughs> Director of the new Charles W. Brown Planetarium, Director of the Ball State Observatory, former Director of the South American Telescope of the Southeastern Association, can't you get a longer title? <laughs> Southeastern Association for Research and Astronomy, teacher extraordinaire, current conference host and update lecturer. God, is there anything this man can't do? Ask your wife. <laughs> Ron has accomplished something no one else in history has been able to do. Shut me up. I don't know if you want to mute that one too, Tom. Okay. Uh, wow. Why do these take so long? I forget what I was going to talk about. Um, first off, I can't tell you how tickled I am and touched to have you all here. Really, I mean, we're proud of this place, and uh, the new planetarium in particular. And that was 15 years of my life, you see, finished there. And don't think it doesn't you know, affect me. Anyway, but, 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 please thank Dana. Yeah. 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 Because while all this construction stuff was going on, I was attending sometimes two meetings a week with architects and, other, and subcontractors. She was keeping all this afloat, and she took on an awful lot of responsibility. I'm trying to try and give her next week off, but she probably won't listen to me. <laughs> anyway, let me get going. Asteroid impact of last year. Y'all remember this, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it's not the one I'm talking about. You're thinking of the one in Siberia. Uh-huh. Uh-uh. No. Seriously. Now, in keeping with last night, this is a story. Uh, and large portions of this are true. All right. 
I have a. Uh, okay, why did that not come out? That's not what I wanted to put in. Okay. I have a habit of checking certain web pages in the morning. You know, you read your paper. I, I often just check certain web pages. One I always check is astronomy, uh, astronomy uh, spaceweather.com. And uh, I look at things there. This is a typical page. And yet I can see how the sunspot activity is going on, auroras, and so on and so forth. But also you can have a cool thing down the page uh, where they talk about near-Earth asteroids. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they you know, give you the, the date of closest approach to the Earth and how far it is in lunar distances. I'll compare the distance in the moon, you know, 40,000 miles roughly, and the size of the impactor, and they color code it. If it's, you know, kind of a salmon color like this, it's indicating that it's uh, kind of close. I don't know what their actual limit is, but it's kind of close within a few, few distances of the moon from us. Well, one morning, as I was gulping my coffee, I looked at the one for the morning. <laughs> Hmm. I, this is not Photoshop. This is it. And lunar distance, near, missed distances, is a thousandth of the lunar distance. And it was red, by the way. Redder than it's showing there. So I started doing the math. Now, when they say, well, a thousandth of lunar distance, you take 240, uh, roughly 240,000 miles, divided by a thousand, you get 240 miles. But, the way astronomers measure distances is from the center, right. uh, not the surface. Now, the Earth is 8,000 miles across, so it raised about 4,000 miles, and we're going to get within 200 miles of the center. That's collision. Predicted collision. Um, in fact, this is, I hope this plays. Let's try it this way. I don't know if you can see that, how well you can see in the back. But there's a little fuzzy dot there that's going back and forth. This is only five arc minutes across, and those pictures are eight minutes apart. This thing was just blazing at a high speed because it was very close to the Earth. In fact, it was coming right for us. Now, there were then predictions where to look for this thing, where it might impact. And that's the, the purplish uh, streak there over the map is showing the highest probability area. They couldn't exactly predict it exactly where this thing was going to come in. All for real. So how does our media respond to this? <laughs> well, not a lot, because I think most of you never hear, heard of this, right? Yeah, okay. Well, the first people to pick up with this actually were meteorologists. <laughs> well, <laughs> then the, the more mainline media picked up from the meteorologists. <laughs> Actually, it was discovered, oh, a lot of mic here. It was discovered only 19 hours before impact. And they did the orbital solution like a day later. They didn't even know it had impacted until after all the math was done. And they said, oops, <laughs> where did that go down? Well, it did go down in the ocean. And using some... Low frequency audio detecting systems our military uses to detect nuclear detonations, test destination. Uh, where those circles kind of all intersect was the general area where they think it went down. And checking ships and ship logs and things, no one saw it. Because it wasn't that big. It was like 13 meters across. Had it come down to your backyard, it would have ruined your day. <laughs> and your neighbor's day. So these kind of things go on all the time, and quite often our folks in Washington don't fully appreciate. You know, we, I, I see space.com in particular make a real hype um, not that long ago about an asteroid that was coming like four lunar distances away, and because it was kind of a biggish thing, and they made a big deal about it. Well, that's okay. Uh, and the media did a little bit too. But like a week later, we had one that went underneath the communication satellites. No mention of it. 
you know, in the last few years, I think I know three or four that have done that. Sooner or later, well, like happened in Siberia, you know that story. It's the same kind of, same kind of thing. Okay, asteroids. Let's talk about asteroids. I know you can read that. This is dimmer than I thought it was going to be. Asteroid surprises. Um, we like to watch occultations of solar system objects. That is, when they, in their path, or orbital path, they go in front of a background star. And then the star, like, dims. We say, well, big deal. But how it dims, how long it dims, well, for an asteroid, it gives you an idea of its size, much more accurate by timing that. Uh, if it's a planet, we can even see it dim as, the, as light from the star goes through the atmosphere as the planet comes in front of it. So this, these things are really watched with great scientific interest. I want to show you the brightness plot for this thing. What you expect, of course, is this, as the asteroid comes in front of the star, the light of the star will be constant until it comes across and it should drop off. And eventually the asteroid comes, uncovers the star again and it comes back up. Right? Well, yes and no. Whoa. Yeah. This asteroid has a ring. You like Saturn stuff? This is a dinky asteroid. Uh, this is only, I forgot what the asteroid size is. The ring, the ring size is only like 165 miles across. So how does it rock it to have a ring? In case you're not following the logic here, and I'm sure, of course, my laser pointer doesn't work on that screen anyway, but uh, in case you're not following the logic here, this drop here happened earlier because it was the part of the ring that hit the star first. It's very narrow, so after it uncovered the star, the light went back up. Now the, uh, now the uh, asteroid comes across, blocks it out. <laughs> Sit down, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other side of the ring here. In fact, you can't see it. Yeah, we can't see the point. Yeah, I know. It's okay. You understand. You understand the idea. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. By the way, the reason we're in this room versus downstairs is we got all this equipment. We have only have about 20 minutes to go downstairs and set up. So we're we're trying to save Tom's back and make everything work. You know, that stuff. So that's one reason we chose this room. But it has its downsides. So anyway, you know, on trips of imagination, this thing's got a ring. Most likely, what we're talking about is a ring of just all this trash. <laughs> uh, it's most likely dust. And so most likely, this sucker suffered a collision in the asteroid belt. And somehow, the dust particles gravitationally even though that thing has got incredibly weak gravity, was enough to form a ring system. That all can happen if the, if, if the energy of impact isn't very high. So the particles can't, don't have a lot of kinetic energy, they can't get very far away, and the feeble gravity will they'll hang on to this little streams of dust. Okay, on to our second little thing. Asteroids with tails. Those are not comets, Those are, that's two pictures of an asteroid. It's in the asteroid belt. First of all, there are a few real comets known to be in the asteroid belt, just to confuse all of us. <laughs> not supposed to be there. This one actually, though, is not. Those tails apparently, once again, appear to be dust. And there are multiple tails. At one point, it had seven. And the thinking is, and it's just thinking at this point, that this thing is, we do know it spins quickly. And literally, dust on the surface, and asteroids are dusty things, work their way down to the equator, quotation marks, and get flung off. There's a high speed spinning. That's the theory. Why do you have distinct tails? Well, because it seems to be distinct episodes of this dust coming down toward the equator. It's a working hypothesis. I think you and I could sit here and all poke fun at it, or even holes in it, but in fact, that's what we're working on right now. Okay, got to keep going. We got a lot to do here. Comets. Well, you know, when I was amateur astronomer, undergrad in college, we had no idea what a nucleus of comet really looked like. We always saw the coal in the tail, and nobody could even resolve that little pinprick that was in the center. 
And so when you went to these artist conceptions, they were more like paintings, we didn't have computer graphics then, you know, they were more or less something that looked like a ball, because we didn't know what else to draw. You know, the little dirty snowball. Then of course we got our first close-up picture of Halley's. Oh my goodness, it's shaped like a potato. And by the way, it's black. It's got a carbon uh, compounds crusting the surface. And the way things come off as it warms up, it's not a nice uniform glowing sphere. They come out in these sh jets that break through the crust, which act like little rocket thrusters, and that's why the orbits keep changing. Now all that became clear. But they had all kinds of shapes. How about a bowling pin? That's Comet Pirelli. Well, this one's a little more round. This is Comet Vilt 2. Two pictures of the same comet. Uh, the contrast stretched on the right. You can begin to see a little bit of the shedding going off the surface of that one. But the thing that we keep seeing in these things, like you do here on Temple 1, is the surfaces are complicated. We were expecting these things to be boring, but pristine hunks of the early formation of the solar system, unprocessed, unchanged. Obviously, that's not true. Uh, you have smooth areas there where you don't see any craters. When you see that on a hard surface, it means it's a young surface. It hasn't been there that long. Something has changed the surface. Just like you don't see many impact craters here on the Earth. Uh, it's the same kind of problem or idea. But look at these more recent ones. Hartley, again, like a bowling pin. We, almost looks like we've got two things that glom together here somehow. And the little connecting area in there is absolutely smooth. Don't know what's going on. Don't know what's going on. This is Comet Atakawa. Uh, there are all lots of, lots of you know, boulders and things on the surface. And some of the indications are from the analysis of the deep impact probe, which I should have mentioned when I had Temple up there, is that it appears that the material in there at one point, well, there are clays in there. That requires water, <laughs> liquid water. That requires heat, warmth. This thing's, you know, the whole our whole idea of pristine material untouched is out the window. Then you got this comet, uh, whose name is up there. You can read it. <laughs> CG, CG, comet CG. Yeah, and of course, this is the one where the Rosetta uh, Probe, European Space Agency, has gone into orbit. This thing's a very funny, funny shape. Rosetta took 10 years to get there because it did this gravitational assist thing, which is, um, you know, great for fuel uh, and efficiency, terrible on time. It takes a long time to get to anyone. Um, let me show you a close-up. Those little bumpy things in the middle are boulders. But this is an object whose gravity is so low, you're standing there, don't jump. You're not coming back down. You know, a jump is one way. As this thing tumbles, we get to see this whole thing. Uh, Rosetta is in orbit now, and it's going to try and settle down to a very tight orbit. But the real, the real thing, oh, I should show you the next picture before I get hit myself. Uh, it's already venting. It's, it's inbound to the sun and we're already seeing it vent. It's not going to get real close to the sun. This is not like ISON. This is not going to get that close. It only gets within a little bit more than an AU, one and a quarter AUs from the sun at closest approach. That's an advantage for this because they want to, as long as they can, keep that spacecraft following the comet and watch it evolve as it heats up. If you go too close to the sun, there's so much stuff's going to come off the spacecraft, you'll probably get wiped out. Not to mention the fact we're going to put a lander on it. All right. Delay was supposed to, it's set to land November 12th. Gravity is so weak that once it settles down, it's going to launch two harpoons into the ice to lock itself on, like a cat grab it, you know, something to hang on for dear life. And the idea is to have this thing ride the comet around the sun. And in high def video, watch the surface. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Isn't that cool? Okay. 
Uh, there's something, there's potentially something goofy going on in the Oracle Cloud. And I don't know if I buy the interpretation, but, I'm going to, but it's very intriguing, so I'm going to go ahead and present this. And maybe you heard about it. Let me show you this next object first. Um, and maybe you can see it jumping back and forth in the middle. Yeah, okay, so it should be. Uh, this has the very colorful name 2012 VP113. I'm sure you're all going to remember that. Talk to Slater about how I'd make him remember that. I don't remember that. This thing's about 450 kilometers across. Its orbit. At its closest point to the sun, it's 80 astronomical units, twice Pluto's distance. It goes out to 240 some astronomical units. Okay, that's interesting. <clears throat> but it's not part of the, of the uh, Kuiper belt. In fact, it and Sedna which goes out, it, uh, Sedna goes out at 80 AU at its max. And that gives you some idea of size there. Now, I don't know if you can see that little kind of greenish ring there. That is, that's the, or, that is the Kuiper belt. The Kuiper belt of asteroids, Thomas, excuse me, be, begins about Neptune and goes out to about 50 AU, although it's 40 on average, goes out to 50 AU, and then it abruptly ends. In fact, it's gotten the nickname, it's called the Kuiper Cliff. <laughs> No one quite understood why. These suckers are orbiting outside that. Now, you may know that that's one reservoir comets. There's another one that's way out. Now, we're talking 50 AU, 100 AU, something like that. Well, the rest of the comets are out like a thousand, thousands of AU, actually. That's the Oort cloud. Uh, never drawn to scale, of course. We can't do it. But... <clears throat> Uh, if you look at the top, we've got uh, the Kuiper belt, which begins beyond uh, Neptune's orbit and goes out 58 to and ends, and all that is shrunk into a little blue smidge there in the middle, uh, trying to represent the Oort cloud, where the vast reservoir, the long period comets come from. So the question is, well, for a long time, why the distinct groups, for one thing, why the Kuiper cliff, and what are these other two objects telling us. Their orbits are so strange, we have trouble explaining how they got that way. Here's the hypothesis. Out there in the Earth cloud, we've got another planet. <laughs> Several times the mass of the Earth. It gravitationally keeps stirring things up. And dynamicists think they can make that work in numerical simulations. Footnote. Long footnote here from there. When you when you took, if you took elementary physics or, or even astronomy, well, all we ever talked about is Kepler's laws. Kepler's laws only work when the entire universe only has two objects in it. <laughs> <laughs> then they work perfectly. Uh, but when you start talking about any situation, we've got lots of other things all interacting with one another, all having their gravitational tugs on one another. That's an in-body problem, and that's problem. And the only way we can really approach that is of doing numerical simulations, and that's only as good as the supercomputer you've got, and the time you have, and so on, so on, so on. So, we can't give real definite answers to something. Oh, and by the way, even though you got it in the supercomputer, and you run it for a, the equivalent of, say, a th watch them for the, go to the equivalent of a thousand years, but the question is, we're interested, is this thing stable, or how's it going to change over millions of years, or billions of years, and we don't have that kind of computer crunching ability yet. So that's why it's still an open question. They can kind of make that work. They can kind of put an object out there and stir things up. Oh, by the way, we don't know anything about the Oort cloud, actually, except it's out there. We don't have any pictures of it. And we, we just are guesstimating it's probably a sphere. Because long period comets come in from all directions. That's kind of telling it's a sphere. But is it uniform? Doubt it. All right. Real quick one for Mars this time. Sometimes the whole talk's been about Mars. Um, we have Curiosity, of course, rover, and the bottom line is, here it's at the bottom of Gale Crater. This was the bottom of the lake, period. How much doubt? None. But more interesting, unlike other places that were once 
wet on Mars. It's obvious from here that the water was different. Other places on Mars were so, uh, showed moisture, were so highly uh, either acidic or uh, just incredibly salty that no one could believe life would be there. Not here. This is more like neutral pH. This is more like 70 degrees Fahrenheit. This is more like home. A long time ago. Mars, as you know, can't do that today. And what you're seeing there are sedimentary rocks. And there's clays in it. It's the bottom of an old lake. Period. Nobody here is that waiting to hear that. Yes. Yeah. People no longer hedging it. No. Uh, mystery. You know about Titan, Saturn's moon. Got this thick atmosphere, smoggy atmosphere covering. Uh, the Cassini spacecraft is imaging it a lot, but it has to use infrared and even radar to see what's through those smoggy clouds. And there seems to be these vast lakes, or even maybe better say oceans, of, of, some, of liquid ethane or something. And they are incredibly flat, no structure. It's, it's, it's like not having a single ripple going on for miles. Can you imagine some lake on the Earth like that? That's because things are just so calm, we think. Well, sometimes. There's, there's just the one picture, but that's what I'll show you. There's a radar image, and again, you can't see it well, but this is on, you can see this on the web. We got three images here. I don't know, I don't have the dates where I can read them here, but they're less than a year apart. In fact, one of them is just a couple weeks apart. And the thing in red there doesn't exist in the other two pictures. And this is at, this is on a shoreline of one of those lakes. So the question is, how whatever that is disappear or reappear or whatever? And no, it's not tides. They went through the whole list of what it could possibly be. Is there a tidal level going up, you know, like we see in the Bay of Funday or something on Earth? No, it's none of that kind of stuff. And then I'm wondering now if it's something that floated to the surface for a while or something. Is it, is it vast bubbling or something? You know, things can change. We don't know why. Cool mystery. Cool mystery. Kepler. It's not dead yet. Had three has three reaction wheels. These, these are just gyroscopes. These are literally just wheels that spin. They can torque off of them and use that for st stability and pointing of the spacecraft. They need a minimum of three, as you know, and they had a spare. Well, they've lost two. They only got two left. You can't hold lock anymore with just two. So they were watching that nice little patch up there in the sky, you know, near Vega, between Vega and, and, and the Swan, Cygnus. And they were locked on that all this time to stay on the same field of about 150,000 stars watching, trans watching for transits and planets. All well and good, but when you can't lock, you can't do that. And so the thought was, oh, well, this whole thing's lost. Well, astronomers are clever folks, especially when they talk to engineers. And what they decided is there's something about the shape of the spacecraft that might allow them to find stability on one axis. The spacecraft, it's got these, well, it's not a complete, I can't say it's a hexagon shape, it's just going around, but it's got these arc panels. And the fact is, if you allow sunlight to hit it, and you can't help that, of course, uh, light has pressure. It really does. And you're in a vacuum, you, you, it's, it's noticeable. And so what they're doing is, let me take you to view now, looking straight down. You let the light hit that point, and as long as the spacecraft is aimed into it, it's balanced. If it tends to get off balance, in fact, it'll correct itself. So, whoops, that's not what I wanted. All right. Well, come on, come on, come on. I thought I had one more slide. Anyway, so it, it, this alone gives you one dimension of stability. The, the two reaction wheels can take care of the other two. But to do that, this has to be lying in the plane of the ecliptic because that has to be pointing to the sun, right. not up there in Cygnus. So we have a new mission. That field is, is all observed now. They can't go back to it. So what does this really buy you? 
This is the way it works. There's the orbit of, uh, of, of the Kepler around the sun, the orbits of the sun. And what they're doing is they can use that angle from the sun, radiation pressure from the sun, to keep it locked into a particular field of view. I don't know if I'm going to be able to see the mouse down here. Now. This, ah, not like that here. Now. To stay in this particular field of view as, as the spacecraft drifts upward here. But they only can do that for about 80 days because, you know, it's going around the curve. And if, it, if you keep pointing in that direction, sooner or later you're going to be looking at the sun. Because you're on the ecliptic and, you know, they don't like to put sunlight on <laughs> it. You know what that does in the telescope, right? Yeah. Uh, so every 80 days they have to go to a new field. They just turn the spacecraft. So now the mission is you're looking at new fields, new par parts of the sky every 80 days. That's the ecliptic over the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. And those are the fields of study now. And they've actually already done two of them. It's working. Not quite at the extreme photometric precision they had before, but it's better than we can use it on the ground. And now they're saying, well, we're not just looking for exoplanets. We'll look at anything interesting in those fields, which is good. Good news. A lot more science to be done. So Kepler's not dead. In fact, it's got a whole new life, a new phase, new mission. We now have a picture of a brown dwarf star. Isn't that cool? And the way we, that was done, or could be done, is because one was discovered, actually a pair was discovered, uh, just a little bit more than uh, six, uh, up here, six light years away. That's close, stars go. Look, Alpha Centauri is four. This is not that much further. That means in a telescope, that brown dwarf is bright because it's not so far away. Brown dwarfs are intrinsically dim light bulbs. You know, we don't see them at a great distance. They just don't put out enough energy. But having one within six light years, it means it's bright enough that with a very big telescope, you can do decent high dispersion spectroscopy and apply a technique that's been around for a while, but it's, it's a Doppler imaging thing, and I don't have Believe me, the conference is not long enough for me to explain this in a way that we're all going to follow, but it's not important. You can actually piece, piece through the, a profile of an absorption line, and you can get out the surface brightness across the object. But you need a lot of light, you need big tunnels of high dispersion. And then it looks like this. Now, those are brightness variations. It's not color-coded for temperature. This is just brightness. It's all we can tell you. And the dark areas are some sort of cloud patterns. We, th we think this is sort of like Jupiter. You're seeing clouds and stuff. The clouds there, though, are not such nice clouds. They're probably, well, first of all, it's a little cold. <laughs> and, and they probably involve some, they're saying zinc. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Uh, not me. Uh, and others, other things. But. At least you can talk about following how this changes with time, perhaps. Bottom of the main sequence. There's the question in white. How do we distinguish, observationally, looking, between the coolest, real, real, true stars and brown dwarfs? Brown dwarfs are not fusing, you might recall. They are gravitationally squishing under their own weight. That generates enough heat that they do shine, at least in the IR. But you can also have stars that shine in the IR. They do fuse, they're just they're very low mass. And they're going to look pretty much the same. How do you distinguish? Interesting trick was done. And this defines the bottom of the main sequence. There's a graph, you can't read it well. The vertical axis is size, how big. Horizontal axis is the surface temperature. Now the main sequence does that. Stars way up high, remember the HR diagram, those are the nice big bright things, and they're large. As you go down, they will get dimmer and smaller. And this is sort of the bottom of the main sequence coming down there in red. How far down can it go before we're sure we don't have something that's a real star? Something that really has turned off fusion. Well, here's the deal. With ordinary stars, Radius will decrease as you decrease temperature. Like I said, you're going down the main sequence.
we've always known that that should probably be around 2100 degrees, whereas it should be near the bottom. But we'd like to actually measure it, not just calculate it, and see if we got it right. Then there'll be a gap. We expect there won't be any objects. And then with time, the radius is going to increase with decreasing temperature. That happens because brown dwarfs don't have fusion in the middle. This changes their internal structure. It changes the, things like the, uh, the gradient of the temperature. I mean, it's really, if you're fusing in the middle, it's really hot there. If it's not fusing, it's hot, but not that hot. And that changes the entire structure of something, how it behaves. And so you expect that they're going to, well, let me get you a little more scores up there. Basically, you can find where this ends. If you get enough stars measured with great enough precision, you should be able to figure out where the bottom of the main sequence is and once and for all, blank, measure it. It is 2100 degrees. <laughs> Radius is about 8.7% of the sun. Eight thousandths of the luminosity. You go any further in temperature, those aren't stars, it's a brown door. That's simple. Even the gap was expected. Now this, this is stylized, let me go back here a bit. Obviously it's kind of a stylized thing from the data, but they actually found the gap. They, they worked on, this people from uh, Georgia State, Sergio Dietrich, I think I got there, was, was the lead of this, and they worked on this for years and do see the gap. They had 80-some stars. <laughs> Great moment in cosmology. Or maybe not. <laughs> you may have heard, well, let's back up. This has to do, of course, with the background radiation. You've all seen plots like this. We saw one on the dome the other night. Um, this is the one from the Planck probe. This is a temperature thing. It's showing the, this, is, this, this is light coming from about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So it's a very old light. And it's showing us that the universe was almost a constant temperature, but not quite back then. And the reds and stuff are a little bit hotter than the blues and so on. And, and, and we're talking like a thousandths or ten thousandths of a degree. I mean, this is really just not much radiation. But nevertheless, those are the denser areas which eventually would have produced, I would guess, galaxies and things. But we don't know those details. Well, besides the fact there's light there, light's going to have a quality to it. One of the things is called polarization. Polarization, like most of the light in this room, is random. And the, you, know, you can take polarized sunglasses and twist it all you like. You'll see nothing change. You go off light that's reflected off a car windshield, you do notice it's polarized. The Big Bang would have polarized, especially if it went through an epoch of inflation and we had gravitational waves. It would, it would be polarized in a very specific manner called B-mode polarization. And the holy grail was, could you see that? And how strong it would be, it would be a huge confirmation, or contradiction for that matter, of our ideas about the early universe. This is a station down in the South Pole. It goes under BICEP2. Don't ask me how they got that name exactly. You know, they, they were trying to find clever things. And like that. Anyway, the idea was they were, they were looking very precisely at the po for polarization. Now, it was expected that this would be really hard to do. And they'd be at it for years. Instead, in very short order, relatively speaking, they published in a press release, bingo, we've got it. The black line's indicating how the polarization is moving. Hooray. Inflation is confirmed. This shows gravitational waves exist. This is the address to send the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and maybe it will be a Nobel Prize. However, it came too easily. And that got a lot of folks wondering. They took their published data, other groups, and compared it to the dust distribution in the galaxy. You know, we have to look out a galaxy, and there's always, always dust there. Guess what dust does to light? Did you, and of course, we all knew that. Did you correct for it? Well, they said, yes, we did. We used so-and-so, such-and-such, I don't know the reference, such-and-such is such catalog of dust. We use that. The other group says, you used the crummy one. Here's the good catalog. <laughs> it's been redone. And when we use this one, we don't see that in your data anymore. Uh -oh. That's where we are with this. Uh -oh. yeah. 
So there was a lot of hoopla about that. And uh, right now, it's not, nothing to talk about until it's settled. I want to, what am I doing on time? Oh, jeez. Uh, I want to end with this. I'm back to planets. You and I all grew up with the fact there are two kinds of planets. Right? And the way that works is because we belong to a system of planets. And up until recently, the only ones we knew anything about. And we came up to all kinds of generalizations based on a sample of one. Um, that there are two types of planets. Well, you, you know, the, you've got the terrestrial planets, those are the rocky ones, and this is where, you know, they, you know Star Trek people can land and things. <laughs> and then there's these, which they don't talk about much in Star Trek, which are the gas giants. And that's it. Well, let me, let me keep going. Look at densities. Density is a real important thing to look at, you know, if you took an average piece of chunk out of the halfway from, from the center to the edge, drill down, grab a hunk of that rock or gas, whatever's there, and take one that's a centimeter by a centimeter by a centimeter, half inch by half inch by half inch, weigh it. It gives you a lot of information right away. Here's the terrestrial plants. Maybe you can't read it all, but on the left is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and they're all above four grams per cubic centimeter. And then, bingo, you hit Jupiter, and you're below two. Saturn's below one. You've all heard the story about Saturn in the bathtub would float and leave a ring. You've heard all that, okay. Uh, you, you're in this and that, too, are a little bit more. They're like one. So there's this huge difference. That's just, yeah, these are two really different kinds of planets. Uh, well, we can continue this. Uh, this is mass, and you can barely see Mercury on the bottom there, and Earth, and suddenly you get to Jupiter, it's way up. This is in this is in units of the Earth. So Jupiter is 318 times the mass of the Earth. Huge difference between the two. Okay, obviously two groups. Size. Well, you knew that was different. So you got the four interterrestrial planets. The biggest one's us, Earth. And then you have all these others. And the smallest one there is really Neptune. Yours is about the same size, but about four. So there's a big gap in size between one and four. Well, why is that? Well, you know, we have, we have theoretical astrophysicists. They came up with a whole explanation why it has to be that way. <laughs> and this goes back to the consequences of how the solar disk was when the solar system was forming. If you're in close to the sun, even the infant sun, it had been really, really hot. All the light elements would have been evaporated. They would know, escape. And only the heavier, and the only look at the outside would you have everything was cool enough that that would give you this big difference in the way the planets form. And if I had more time, I'd explain it, but it's wrong anyway. So. <laughs> or at least incomplete. Yeah. Incomplete. Because Kepler, good old Kepler, uh, changed the rules. Because now, we can talk about other planetary systems. What do they really look like? Instead of, you know, is the solar system schizophrenic or something? You know, some, I mean, I, is, is it really a good example? And the answer is no. Now, remember, Kepler only measures size. Really, that's all I ever measured. You see a lot of press releases with all the mass and this and this and this, dinosaurs and clouds and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, and the only thing it really measured was the diameter. With precision, but that was the only thing it did. And it does it by the depth of the transit. The, the bigger the planet, the more it blocks, the more light it blocks, the deeper the, you know, the more light you lose. And you get an idea of the size, at least compared to the star it's orbiting. Those are just a few examples there. So, Kepler now a huge database of thousands of planets, we can look at how are the sizes arranged. We've got this gap in the solar system between one and four Earth's diameter. Okay, this results. See the orange bar? That's between one and four. Most of the planets are there. 
three quarters of the planets in the universe have sizes between Earth and Neptune. It's one of the most popular sizes in the parking lot. I mean, it's, it's, like, like, what happened? Nothing like ignorance, right? You show up sooner or later. Um, got a little graphic at the bottom, but you know, the Neptune size thing there is peaking quite a bit. Um, this gets us in the whole thing. You, you've been hearing about super Earths and that kind of, I want to try and clarify that for you because it's been used even in the, even the scientific literature in some contradictory ways. It's now being sorted out a bit, but I want to show you where the terminology is headed. Because super Earths is a slippery slope. But super Earths are the ones that live in that area between two and four. Or actually one and a half and four. All right. So most of them. Actually, about three quarters of them. Now, look, just one quick statement about densities here. Um, how do we get them? Well, first of all, I've got to have the mass of the star. Kepler can't tell you that directly. It can be inferred sometimes. But generally, all it knows is size. Uh, what you have to do is find a big telescope. Someone who has a fantastic spectrograph and, and measure the, the, the movement of the star. By the way, when they talk about reflex motion of the star, what your audience, my audience, always thinks is we're up there watching the star wiggle back and forth. No <laughs> way can we see that. What we're talking about is using the Doppler shift to see very small variations along the line of sight as the planet pulls that star back and forth. It's very tough to do. And you need a really high precision spectrograph. In, in the world, I think right now there may be five or so that can do this. All the telescopes, among the maybe five. They're at the point now they can detect Doppler shift in light of walking speeds. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's at the hairy edge. It's noisy, but they can do that. So that gives you the mass of the planet. It's by how much it's pulling that star. Uh, then you go to Kepler, how much, or even ground-based telescopes. How much did it dim? That gives you the size. So now you have mass, you got radius, oh, radius of the sphere, or for pi r cubed. And so you do that, and do a division, and my students grumble sometimes, I make them do the division. And, <laughs> and so you, you've just simply got mass of the planet. This gives you an average density. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's not in any particular place. It gives you an average density of this planet. It's great. And so what we're expecting, of course, would you always find the good old terrestrials around five, grams per cubic centimeter, and then you'd find the old uh, gas bags, you know, the round one, and never anything in between. Well, they showed you. There's lots in between. I want to follow the density trail here. Recent study. Uh, it's hard to see what it is, but it's okay. Hang on. I'll explain it. We combine all the data. A lot of ground-based telescope stuff. And what's graphed there, the vertical axis is density from 0 up to 15, actually. Horizontal axis is size compared to the Earth from about 0 to 4. You notice on the left-hand side, we've got, well, pretty much a, I'm not drinking coffee on the keyboard, the university wouldn't like that. Uh, we've got some tight fitting here. On a straight line going up, you get in the neighborhood of you know, not quite two times the Earth, and suddenly the pattern appears to change. I know the air bars are big, but you get out here, you see they're not so big. So you can see there is a trend; it drops off. They get well, they get larger, but the density didn't. So they got bigger, but the density. Well, all that means is that their structures them. They're made of different kinds of stuff. This is not made of lead anymore, or whatever. It's, it's got to be something that's fluffy make that happen. But there's this break where things change around two Earths. That's the way nature is, do is producing these things. Let's see if this graph helps with it. Like this. Oh, that's because it's doing that. All right. So as planets grow, they become larger and denser because they compress. You start on the left-hand side of that graph. They're getting denser because their gravity is squishing them down. Okay, that works for a while. But around one and a half to two, the game changes, apparently. Now, 
density drops with increasing mass. You put more material on to make up the planet heavier, you're you know, feeding it, it's not going to get denser. This means the way nature somehow does it is it's putting lower density materials like hydrogen, helium, ammonia, methane, and what you're making are, you can't read it there, mini Neptunes. Neptune is four, these are between you know, two and four. Or gas dwarfs. Warning. Astronomers like the terms that they coined. <laughs> and so there are some teams that we, we notice this and we call them these mini Neptunes. There's another group that says, we noticed it too, maybe we were better at it, and we call them gas dwarfs. You'll see both being referred to, and they're both talking about exactly the same thing. And they don't use each other's terms. That took me a while to sort through that. There's that graph again, but it's just, you know, with some color and so on. But it's not saying anymore. So, let's get this wrapped up with the super Earth and, and other technology, the terminology you're going to encounter. So here's our mini Neptune graph. And ah, you can't read it, but we're looking at the sizes all the way from a little bit more than the Earth up to four times. And we think one and a half to four. That's probably the structure. They all have a rocky core. And now we have layers of water, hydrogen, even hydrogen. In other words, we're making fatter things that look. It's the transition between terrestrial and gas giants. Think about it. There had to be something of transition. That's what these are. These are the transitional planets. And they're really, really common. Even though we have never seen one. So, types of planets. We got a graph here, horizontal line going from one Earth out to four. And the left-hand side there, I'm going from got little, little drawings of planets going from one to two Earths in size. And those areas we now are called super Earths. So up to about two Earths. Then from about two to four, those are the mini Neptunes, or gas dwarfs. And after that are gas giants. So our terminology is changing and it's sort of like remoting Pluto or renaming Pluto. You know, it wasn't like that when I was in school. Well, okay, that's good. It says something's changed. You know, we're making some progress. Uh, you know, I got another graph of this done a different way. Here are the three types of planets again. We have the terrestrial planets going from one to two, mini Neptunes from about two to four, and beyond four, those are Jovian gas giants. Sorry, we wrote your textbook. I don't have a single textbook that has this in it. No. I don't want it. I don't want it. But when you look at things online and you look at things in the literature, this is all being taught in these terms now. Well, I want to end with one illustration. And I don't know why, but I thought of Gary. <laughs> no, 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 it's not that bad. It's just. <laughs> Uh, and, and I don't know if anyone in the back, is, is, you have to see this to see what it is. It's <laughs> 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 nothing to do with my talk, but I was, <laughs> I was saying if all the people taking pictures yesterday, I, I got into about a half a dozen. Uh, I, was, I wondered, was anybody doing that? Behind? Anyway, uh, I'll take. I'll take. Yes, Chris. Recently, I've heard people talking about ice giants, maybe as a replacement term for Jovian. But is that a fourth type, or is that just? No, ice giants have been used to kind of talk about Neptune and Uranus and Neptune because I think they've got a higher percentage of water in them, and that's a term I see come and go all the time. And this is really confusing. I, w I wish all of us would, astronomers would just start using the same terms, huh. stop confusing everybody. Um, but they all, some of think their terms better because it's more graphical, visually graphical, what, what they think is going on. You have to remember the one time we sent a probe into Jupiter looking for water, and who would find it? We didn't. So I, I, no, I'm kind of, I hold back on that term. Yeah. Yeah. 
I was just going to comment, uh, the other day a student walked into a colleague's astronomy class and announced that Antares blew up. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> there was this uh, discussion as to whether they'd see a supernova remnant where Alpha Scorpion was, and it turned out to be the supply rocket going up to the uh, <laughs> yeah. Sadly. It didn't get that far. No. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. With this one small asteroid having rings, is there are there worries that Pluto can have a ring and that could endanger the New Horizons? I don't know if there's been an occultation of Pluto or not. Maybe you remember. I don't know. Uh, that's the way you're really going to find it. Yeah. There's all kinds of concern. There's all kinds of crud around Pluto. It's got some so many rooms. It's may look like it's a debris, debris field from collisions or something. In which case, uh, that crap may be on a kamikaze mission. With, uh, with more uh, gas dwarfs being found in other planets that make a popular size, um, what kind of implications are there for like a, a solar system development? Like we have a bunch of planets, they gobbled up a bunch of uh, material farther out. Was there more material? in this solar system when developing than some of the other places we're observing, you know? Uh, is your question, I'm trying to follow your question, you're trying to, how do we account for the differences between not having? Yeah, yeah, like what are implications of those mid-sized planets? <laughs> I honestly don't know, I wonder the same thing. Because um, it's gonna impact our whole thinking about how the solar system formed versus how three quarters of the rest of them form. And it may just be some sort of random thing that a little bit differently. I don't have a good answer for that. I really don't. And that is an important question. What else? What else? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about the consensus, if there is any, in the astronomical community about the rejection of the polarization work for um, the Big Bang. Well, I don't know if there's a consensus yet or not. I mean, um, I, I think there's great fear that, it, that, that those folks went to a press release way too soon. Um, because after the, the shot across the bow thing, if you really use the right dust data, everyone knows how incredibly, incredibly difficult it is to do what they're trying to do. And um, I, I, I think, if you want me to guess, I think the thing's been shot down. Well, how does that affect the how does it affect the primary career? It depends. It, it, in this case, because it was so difficult, I don't know that it does. But when you have Pons and Fleischmann, mm -hmm. you, you, we know what happened there. Their careers were destroyed. We, 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 over the last 20, 30 years, have gotten in this country, especially this country, in the sciences where, because, and largely because people are in institutions, sometimes they're universities, but they really want the PR that you're pushed to have big name, splashy press releases. And therefore, they've not gone through what we used to do, which was peer review. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why that kind of stuff gets caught. I've personally been a reviewer of many, many papers. And at least in one case, and I remember very vividly, I pointed something out, and they, and anonymously, because the way you do it, and the authors came back and said, thank you for keeping us look, looking like fools. <laughs> they had made a mistake. Uh -huh. and, I, I, and I recognized it because it was a mistake I had made once. Uh -huh. One of those things. So that wouldn't have ruined their careers, but peer review has its place, and we're not doing enough of that. Right. Right. And the folks from places like Harvard think, well, there's no one can review us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll just go to the press room. Well, sometimes it bites you. It doesn't wipe out a career. Occasionally it does. Um, it can. Yeah. This is sort of building on this question, and it may actually the same question, just asked differently. But as a result of the Kepler work, is there an emerging classification system or proto ideas about solar system classifications, different models, initial conditions that somehow? Uh, I'm sure there is. It's not my field of research, so I'm not the most current on this. When you talk, that, the, the kind of questions you're both asking require, are right at the cutting edge. And I'm not on the cutting edge in that area. I work, I work with binary stars and interaction, and even binary stars that have exoplanets. One of the things I work on. 
formation is not one of the I work on. Um, I'm sure it will. It's going to have to be kind of creative, too. Like always. Like always. Way in the back. I can't see who you are, but yeah, go. <laughs> uh, what's that? <laughs> they were saying something about. Um, oh, comets don't they smell what good? Comets smell bad. Smell bad. They, 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 yeah, well, I, I, I think if, if, if you go out into the vacuum of space and smell a comet, you have bigger problems than you <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Io's got sulfur on it, it stinks, we know that. Yeah, that's what they were saying. Something but but the whole thing about smell, I always I always cringe when I hear that because it's it's not even a, a doable thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, it made a good headline. Exactly. <laughs> and it, it, you may know, if hearing me talk, give these talks enough, that I kind of grate on that stuff. Uh, you say way too much of it, I think. And um, there. So is Rosetta going to have a chance? <laughs> well, uh, Phi which is going to land, is going to analyze the vapors as they come off, and it's going to core or drill about eight or ten inches or something like that, how deep it goes, and, and do a chemical analysis. So if it survives the landing, yeah. oh, and I, sh I had the landing site here. What happened to that? Uh, shoot. I must have gone right over it and not come in. Well, anyway, the, the thing is very rough terrain, and so it's got to survive the landing. And right now, November 12th is the target. Or yeah, the universe is a big place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> okay. Uh, we talked about the <clears throat> planet formation and the heavy earth materials being closer to the sun. So you got the terrestrial worlds closer to the sun. But aren't a lot of the Kepler planets, they, they detect these Jupiter sized yeah. planets in close? Yeah, in close. So the idea that came out of that very quickly was they must have formed further out and migrated inward. Hmm. Migration is the big thing now in the way we think these things form. And you can kind of understand it. it I first heard it, I said, oh my god, you're grasping for straws. And I thought about it a little bit longer. No, they're not. Uh, because in an early solar system, there's a lot of like, stray gas and stuff once the planets form. That's a drag on somebody who's trying to orbit. It drags and loses energy. It spirals in. And the trick is you can't have them fall too far in or you lose the planets. Well, sometimes they probably did do that. There's a few stars that have kind of weird chemical anomalies and say, well, maybe it ate too many planets. Because it brought those heavier elements from further out and brought them in. Anyway, I think we, to stay on some kind of schedule, I'm going to have to call this quits at this point. I hope you enjoy the conference. Thing, just, just the next time I say I'm going to host Glippa, build a planetarium, and do the update talk, kill me. <laughs> okay.